Praise the Lord Live. Uh, go ahead and hit like and uh, hit share. Uh, we want you to again like this. We want you to share it with everybody that you have. Go ahead and call your sisters, your brothers, everybody. Call, call mama them, pookie them, baby brother them, baby sister them. Praise the Lord, all the other hymns that you have. Tell them that house of faith, that we are on the air. Praise the Lord. And that we are live in a living color. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. To all of our YouTube friends that are watching this broadcast, we thank you that you are taking out of your busy schedules uh, to watch it uh, as well. And let them know that every Sunday morning, uh, we are here, praise the Lord, House of Faith Christian Center, glory to God, and we thank God. So again, uh, YouTube, Facebook, praise the Lord, uh, uh, MySpace, I don't know, uh, whatever it is they got, Instagram, Twitter, uh, our Twitter, Chit Chat, Snapchat, all the other chats, it doesn't matter, we just want you to get the word of God this morning. So again, Facebook, go ahead and like and hit share. Even if you don't like me, hit like anyway. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. And share and tell everybody, House of Faith Christian Center, we are on the air right now. So we pray again that you will be blessed to have a blessing in the Word of God. To all of our first time guests, we want to thank you again for coming out of your busy schedule and being a part of what God is doing here at House of Faith Christian Center that we believe it is the fastest growing church here in Smyrna, Tennessee. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. The church where we believe in exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. Glory to God. Well, are you ready for the word this morning? Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'll tell you, the word is going to be so good. You may be biting bite the chair in front of you. Praise the Lord. Just get ready. So I hope you got uh, your pens and pencils and paper ready to tell you. And uh, we're just going to get right into this word of God. And it's truly going to be blessed. So if you would, go ahead and get your Bibles out, uh, your iPads, your iPods, uh, your iRons. Praise the Lord. Everything that has the word of God. And let's go ahead and hold up our Bibles and make this confession of faith. If you would, say these familiar words. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I am now ready. Ready, ready, ready. To receive the dynamic, the powerful, ever increasing, the life changing word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I boldly confess. I'll never be the same. I boldly, boldly confess. I'll never, never be the same. I boldly, boldly, boldly confess. I'll be hearing God's word today. I'll never, never, never be the same. For thine is the kingdom, and mine is the kingdom. For thine is the power, and mine is the power. For thine is the glory, and mine is the glory. Forever, and ever, and ever. For this is my receiving day, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. This is where we're going to off this morning. Praise the Lord. And again, uh, all of our Facebook friends, please go ahead and hit like and hit share. Hit like and hit share. Go ahead and text somebody, email them, call them, tell them the House of Faith Christian Center that we are live and on the air. Praise the Lord. Hit like and hit share. Now, again, we are in uh, uh, our teaching this entire year on grace for the winning church, uh, the body of Christ. And uh, we have been looking at our motto scripture lately. It's Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And it says that Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the first of all who will rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. So grace for the winning church, the body of Christ. So we've been doing an analysis concerning about the church, the body of Christ. Now keep in mind when we talk about the church, we're not talking about the building. We're not talking about the meeting place. All right? We're talking about believers who have accepted Jesus Christ 
as the personal Lord and Savior who have been called out of darkness to walk into the marvelous light. And my friends, if that is you, you are part of the church. Now, when we come together on Sunday morning or whenever we assemble ourselves together, we are known as the church gathered. If I say church gathered. Church gathered. Praise the Lord. And that's where we are. We are the church coming together. People say, I'm going to church. No, I am the church. We're going. We gather together. But listen, when we leave this place and go to our various homes and our businesses and our jobs and our families and our destination, listen, we don't stop being the church. We're just a church scattered. If I say church scattered, church scattered, praise the Lord. So you're scattered in Murfreesboro, in Laverne, or in Smyrna, or surrounding areas. So you never stop being the church. You're just a church scattered. So whether you come together or when you leave, you are the church. First say, I'm the church. Please somebody say, friend, friend, you're the church. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. So we're talking about grace for the winning church, the body of Christ. And so we've been doing an analysis comparing our physical anatomy of our bodies with the church, the body of Christ. And there are remarkable similarities. For example, in your physical body, you have what you call a skeleton, which is your backbone or it is your framework. Your skeleton is what holds you together. Every person has a skeleton. It's the foundation of your physical body. Well, in the spiritual body of the church, we have a framework, and it is called doctrines or teachings that we must hold on that will hold us together. It is the foundation of everything we believe. It is our skeleton, which basically is the foundation. But not also do we have a skeleton, we also have what we call internal organs within our physical anatomy. We have a heart, we have lungs, we have kidneys, we have uh, intestines, uh, 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 we have all of these parts that consist of internally. And although you can't see that, but it is what keeps you alive. It is the vitals of you that allow you to be alive. Well, in like manner, not only do you have uh, that in your physical body, but in the spiritual bodies, we also have internal organs, and these are called the attitudes. These are what we actually believe. Praise the Lord. And so we must have a foundation of what we believe. But lately, we've been looking at the third component of our physical body. Not only do we have a skeleton, not only do we have internal organs, but we also have muscles. And what does muscles do? Muscles allow us to move. Muscles allow us to operate that we have. And we all have those particular muscles. Well, within the body of Christ, we also have uh, muscles, but these are called activities. This is what the church is doing, or what the church should be doing. So we looked personally of what the church should be doing, and we looked at Jesus. We said that Jesus' ministry was threefold. Jesus was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing, according to the word of God. That's what he did. Well, if we are the body of Christ, and if Jesus is the head, and we know that the head is connected to the body, then therefore, if Jesus was teaching, the church ought to be teaching. Amen. If Jesus was preaching, then the church ought to be preaching. Amen. And if Jesus was healing, then the church ought to be healing. Amen. Why? Because this is what we're doing. So it's important not only to have internal organs, which are our attitudes, but it's also important to have muscles, which are activities. What should the church be doing? Praise the Lord. Internal organs is what we believe. Our muscles is what we should be doing since we believe. Because we know that what faith without dead, faith without works is what? Dead. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So today we're going to look at the fourth activity or the muscles, which again allows us to move what the church should be doing. And when I talk about the church, we're talking about the body of Christ, not only collectively, but also individually. Because again, we need to have the muscles. Praise the Lord. So here at House of Faith, under the muscles, we say that our church is not only to move, but it's also to operate and it's important to produce Jesus Christ life results as we move forward in exalting the Savior, equipping the saints, and evangelizing the sinner. 
praise the Lord. So again, the church ought to be doing more than just eating chicken. Okay. Hello, somebody. Yeah. The church ought to be doing more than just having bake sales. Mm -hmm. The church ought to be more than just uh, 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 raffling tickets and having big playing bingo. Mm -hmm. All right? And there are some churches that were doing that. I, you know, and I'm not against it. I'm just simply saying, according to the word of God, what should the church be doing? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So again, we don't want to walk by tradition. We don't want to walk by religion. We don't want to walk by denomination. We want to walk by the word. What should the church be doing? Because we are the body of Christ. And if Jesus did it, praise the Lord, we ought to follow his footsteps. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So number four, the fourth thing that the church we ought to be doing is we should be fulfilling our purpose. Now, did you know that when Jesus came upon the earth, he had a purpose? He knew exactly what he was called to do. And he fulfilled that, that purpose that he had. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. He has sent me to restore the sight to the blind. He has sent me to release the captive from prison. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That was his purpose. That was what he was called to do. And he came doing that. And he fulfilled every assignment that the Father called him to do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, and all of my social media friends, again, hit like and hit share. Because you have to know your purpose in life. You have to know what you're called to do. So the church, the body of Christ, this is the fourth thing our movement is. We must fulfill the purpose. And here at House of Faith Christian Center, we do have five purposes why we are here. And this is where we move in. And this is what the church should be doing. So today we shall look at purpose number one. And this is so vital. This is our movement. This is what we should be doing. And the first purpose of House of Faith Christian Center is to fulfill our purpose through evangelism. That's number one. Through evangelism. Now, I'm sure when I mention this word evangelism, a whole lot of things start circulating in your mind. You probably start thinking about, oh boy, he's talking about somebody standing on the street corner, hollering and saying, either turn or burn. Some of you, when you think about evangelists, you think about going and, and knocking on doors. You know what? Some of you think about passing out tracts. Some of you think about when you speak about evangelism, and you're like, oh my goodness, I'd rather go have a root to there. <laughs> oh my goodness. And you just start freaking up and start you know, freaking out like, oh, evangelism. Some of you think about going to large arenas and, and, and hearing a, a, a minister preach at a football stadium and then give a decision and people start coming out of the stands and gathering around on a football field. So we have all these kind of things that we think about evangelism and this may be the reason why the church is not moving enough in this area of evangelism. So a survey was taken. And the statistics are very interesting as to why the church as a whole is not involved in evangelism. And this question that, that comes up, uh, Billy Graham Evangelist Association took this survey, and this is what they found out. Listen to it. Here's the results. 9% nine, nine of people don't evangelize because they say they're just too busy. To remember it. 28% says that they feel that a lack of real information is shared. They don't feel like they qualified enough 
to share. They don't have enough information, and that's why they don't do it on a consistent basis. 12% says that their own lives are not speaking as they should. In other words, they're saying that my life is not consistent with the word of God, and I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to tell people to do something that I'm not doing myself. So that's the reason why I'm not a witness for Jesus. But here's this. Listen to the last statistics. 51 percent, over half of them says their biggest problem is the fear of being rejected. The pastor, I would witness for Jesus. I, I know what to say. I've got the time. Uh, I, I, I can do it, but you see, I, I'm just a little hesitant because I don't like being told no. I don't like sharing something with somebody and people rejecting my message. So therefore, to keep from being rejected, I'll just keep my mouth closed. And I won't tell people about the goodness of Jesus. Hmm. Well, my friends, as we go on, let's, let's talk a little bit about this thing. And I just want to kind of get you to start thinking because I'm talking about the muscles of the church, what the church should be doing. And we want to make sure that we put everything in proper perspective. Because there's a lot of things that the church is doing, but I want to talk about what the church should be doing. Praise the Lord. Because we're not here to please men, we're here to please God, right? I said we're here to please God, right? And we want to do it. So let's look at this word evangelism that we have. And, and let's kind of define it. And again, I want you to get all the stereotypes of someone standing on the corner, hollering, turn or burn. You going and knocking on the doors and, and, and you know, and people slamming the doors in front of your face and, and you passing out a bunch of tracks and, uh, 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 you know, all those things. But let's get a simple foundation truth about what evangelism is all about. Because if this is what we should be doing, we need to know define what we're going to be doing, right? Here it is, evangelism, this definition. Evangelism can be defined, watch this, as sharing the good news. Everybody say good news. Yes. Notice, the good news that Jesus Christ came to earth, he lived, he died, and was raised from the dead to rescue the world from sin and death. That's evangelism. I'm sharing good news with people. Praise the Lord. That's it. And it's about Jesus Christ, who he is, what he taught, what he did, and what he's doing for us. That's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And I'm sharing good news, and that's what the church has been called to do. And we can all testify that we live in a day that we need to be exposed to some good news. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Have you checked about what's going on in Washington, D.C.? There is no good news. Have you looked at the school system? There is no good news. Have you looked in the government today? I want to tell you, there is good news. Have you turned on the TV and listened to the, the 10 o'clock bad news, or 6 o'clock bad news? There is good, no good news. It seems like we are bombarded, the radio, all about bad news. So in the midst of all that bad news, praise the Lord, we who are children of God, we have been baptized, praise the Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We have been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. We have been commissioned to share some good news. Because people are tired of bad news, and they need to hear some good news. And the person who has the good news is about Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. We got to tell people that there was a man who came through the 42 generations of time wrapped in swaddling clothes as a beggar. And they said he has come to save people from their sins, their past sins, their future sins, their present sins, and sins. He has come to give us life and life more abundantly. That is good news. He has keep, come to keep us from going to hell. He has come to turn the wrath of God from us to, to him. He has come to give us a new way of thinking. That's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We need to tell people about some good news. And if anybody can do it, it's you and me. And you don't need a degree from a cemetery. I mean, the cemetery to do it. Uh, 
Let me see the hands of everybody here to say, raise your hand. Praise the Lord. You say, so guess what? You say because somebody shared with you some good news. Hallelujah. And that good news, it changed your life. It changed your thinking. It changed everything about you. Because one day you heard some good news and you responded to some good news. So since you heard some good news, guess what? You got to share that good news with people around you. Hallelujah. Glory. But what if they don't accept it? What if they do? Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't know. But I do know one thing. If I'm going to tell them, how are they going to hear about it? Amen. How are they going to put faith in a risen Savior if they don't know to hear some good news? Amen. They know about bad news. Yeah. And they're tired of bad news. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so the church, the body of Christ, whether you are collectively or whether we are individually, we ought to be sharing the good news of Jesus. Say it's good news. It's good news. Praise the Lord. Jesus came preaching some good news. The Bible says after John had been placed in the prison, Jesus came to the coast of Galilee preaching the good gospel, the good news of the kingdom. Praise the Lord. And said, repent and believe the gospel. It is a good news. Praise the Lord. To a blind man, it's some good news. To a lame man, it's some good news. To a confused man, it's some good news. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. We've got children on, 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 on ADHD, whatever it is, and all the kind of stuff. They just need to hear some good news. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Now, let's go to our second page. Praise the Lord. Now, so as believers, we understand that this evangelism, it simply means good news. We as the church, we as the body of Christ, we are commissioned to find the lost, the unsaved, and the unchurched. And to do this, this involves developing a five-step strategy for evangelism to share this good news. But before we look at this strategy, let's look at Luke chapter 19, verses 9 and verse 10. Our first scripture. Luke chapter 19, verse 9 and verse 10, concerning this good news. And in your Bibles, Luke chapter 9, verse 9 and verse 10, this is from the uh, 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 King James Version. It says, and Jesus said to him, this is to Zacchaeus. He says, Zacchaeus, listen, today if I say today. today. Not tomorrow, not, to, not next week, not when you get your life together, not when you get all your ducks in the line, not when you stop smoking and drinking and doing all that. No, today, if I say today. Listen, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because you are sons of Abraham. And he says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is good news. We were lost in our sins. Couldn't find our way. On our way to hell. But Jesus, come on somebody. The perfect and sinless son of God. One day he decided to pay a debt that he did not owe. Because we owe debts that we could not pay. We could not save ourselves. So Jesus says, I come to seek and save that which was lost. Hallelujah. So this is the good news that Jesus has come to save. He has come to rescue. He has come to deliver. In whatever situation is, Jesus can bring a person out. Hallelujah. The government can't do it. Education can't do it. Finances can't do it. And only through Jesus, who he was, what he taught, what he shared, how he lived, that can save from our sins. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. So, let's look at this five-step evangelism process that the church gathered, either the church gathered, can start implementing, and this is what the church should be doing because we are the body of Christ and we are the muscles. So let's look at this. Five areas of evangelism. Presence evangelism, number one.
proclamation evangelism. Number two, persuasion evangelism. Number three, progression evangelism. Number four, and production evangelism. Number five, if we focus on these five things, the church will move in a type of way we've never ever seen before. Praise the Lord. So let's look at number one. Presence evangelism. What is presence evangelism? Listen. Presence evangelism is being present in our community. You see, as a church, listen, we must see the needs of the unsaved and the unchurch. That's number one. Number two, we must establish ministries that allow our church to be present in the community. And number three, we must develop a process by which we're able to draw them into the safety of Jesus Christ and our local church. Let's look at the scripture here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to verse 16. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, verse 16, this is Jesus' teaching. We refer to this oftentimes as the Sermon on the Mount, one of his first messages that he brings to his people. And notice his words. Let's focus on his words. He's talking, and he says this. And again, we talk about what the church should be doing, either collectively and also individually. He says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under the basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on the stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds or let your light so shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Ladies and gentlemen, here's our instructions. We are the salt of the earth. Now here's something about salt. Two things about salt I want you to remember. Number one, salt adds flavor. All right? Now, I enjoy popcorn. Okay? Uh, my wife and I went to the movie uh, on yesterday, and we sat and watched a great movie. I mean, this awesome. Uh, the movie Harriet. This is wonderful. You would say, you know, because I'm, I'm avid about history and all our stuff, you know? And, uh, What's the use of going to a movie without popcorn, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I got the popcorn, all right? And that popcorn is so delicious. And, and, and one of this is because we put a little butter on it, put a little salt on it. Have you ever had popcorn with no salt at all? Yeah. Oh my goodness, it's like eating cardboard. Yes. You know, you ever had corn on a car with no salt at all? I did, it wasn't too good. Pastor, I, I try to give it somebody says, I ain't eat that stuff right there. Like, oh, I'm putting salt on my corn. <laughs> Why? Because the salt, it adds flavor to that. Well, Jesus says you're the salt of the world. Guess what? You are to add flavor to what you own. Praise the Lord. And not only does salt add flavor, but what salt? Salt also is a preservative. Yes. It preserves things. People used to, you know, before we got technology and all these fancy things, they used to have their old meat house. Y'all, some of y'all, y'all like that, no, praise the Lord. All right? Now, if you're born in 2000, you know what we talk about. Right? If you're born in 1900, sorry. <laughs> had an old meat house, and they were salted down. Why? Because it was reserved it to last long. Well, listen, you're the salt. You are here to preserve some things so it can last long. So what I'm simply saying about salt. Here it is, in a nutshell. Salt makes a difference. Yes, yes it does. Say that salt makes a difference. Salt makes a difference. Praise the Lord. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, 
uh, I was notified that I had on, on the, in the school system, I had received a prestigious award that they named me as uh, uh, the most outstanding staff member at the school that we have. And uh, you know, I was very, very appreciative. And, and then they, and they interviewed me and the administration asked me this question. Mr. Simmons, being the fact that you're dealing with students who have disabilities, learning disabilities, emotional disabilities, behavior issues, in other words, at times, they will cuss you out, they have cussed me out. And I couldn't cuss them back out, I don't care, I couldn't do it, I couldn't. <laughs> do things to you and you, you can't hit them. You thought about some that, but you can't hit them because I don't want to see y'all see me on six o'clock news going out like this. <laughs> Due to the fact that you deal with all these issues. Due to the fact that we really can't pay you a whole lot of money. Why are you here? And without even just thinking about it, this is what I said. I am here not to make a living, but to make a difference. And the ministry is like, wow. Say that again. I'm here not to make a living, but I'm here to make a difference. I am here to be the salt of the earth to give them flavor and to preserve their lives. That's why I am here. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why you are here. You are on your job, you're in your business. You are here not just to make a living, you are called to make a difference. If I said I'm called to make a difference. Make a difference. And that's what evangelism is. You're being present to make a difference. You may not get all the accolades. You may not get all the packs in the blood. But knowing that Jesus says, you know what? You show up every day. You go to your job every day. You go to your business every day. You take care of your family every day. You take care of your friends, your neighbors every day. You give, you give. Because you are here to make a difference. Amen. And House of Faith Christian Center is a ministry that's called to make a difference. Yes. We have two ladies every Monday. Every Monday. They're here at the YMCA from about 7.30 to 9.30 or 10 o'clock, passing out water, praying for people, ministering to people. And the people come to get their physical body together, but many times they got mental, and they got a spiritual deficiency. And they're here every Monday. They don't get paid to do it. Why? But they're here to make a difference. And that's what the church is called to do, to make a difference, to be present in the community. To say, listen, if you need somebody to talk to, if you need somebody to pray for, if you need somebody just to be there for you, we want to be here for you. And hundreds of people come to these doors every Monday, and they see these ladies and say, you make a difference. Say again, I'm a soul of the earth. I'm a soul of the earth. says, listen, you're the light of the world. Not the light of the church, but the light of the world. He didn't say you're the soul of the church. We just don't sprinkle ourselves here on one another. We sprinkle ourselves into an earth, praise Lord, that don't know about Jesus, don't know about the good news, that's confused, depressed, over-medicated, sick, broke, hurting. We are called to make a difference. You say to yourself, can one person make a difference? Yes, ask Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. And we don't give up on people. Why? Because Jesus didn't give up on us. People may not like us. People may not understand us. People may not agree with us. But people know when we're here to make a difference. So the question we ask ourselves, number one, ask ourselves, who are we really happy? See, I have to ask myself when I go to bed at night time, who did I really help today? Was it all just about me? My emotions, my needs, my bills, my body? Who am I helping? Jesus says, 
You're the salt of the earth, Ron. You're the light of the world. And you must be present in the people's lives to do that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so again, I'll say again, don't give up on people. Because Jesus don't give up on you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So let's press in evangelism. And I say press in evangelism. Amen. Number two, the second is proclamation evangelism. We must proclaim the good news, gospel of Jesus Christ, as a church. We must develop effective ways to communicate the gospel to the unsaved and to the unchurch. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. Everybody say everywhere. Everywhere. Notice in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now I want you to see the progression, the steps. Number one, Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. Number two, you're going to receive power. And then number three, you're going to be my witness. You will be witness with your lips. And I like to say this, you are a witness with your hips. What you say and how you live will be a witness. Amen. Where? Everywhere you go. That's proclamation evangelism. Sharing the good news with people. Praise the Lord. The reason why we're on Facebook, and if you're watching this by Facebook, and you're looking at this right now, the reason why is because we're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether it's YouTube. Whether it's Instagram, whether it's Snapchat, it doesn't matter. We're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason why I have these handouts, okay, and I print them out for you to look at. Because we want to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason why I send you my email, I copy of my message, okay, is because I want you to get this gospel. And you have friends, you have uh, uh, email partners and so forth. You take a gospel, you take this message right here, and you go ahead and share it with many people as well. I mean, you do, you do Facebook with everybody. You share what you had for dinner last night. And people don't even like that food. Why can't you share this gospel with people and say, you know what, this is what our pastor preached on. I want to share some good news because I care about you. That's what we're called to do. So the question simply says is, listen, we must ask ourselves, are we really helping people to hear the good news? Now, people have no problem in telling you their bad news. So it's time for them to start hearing some good news. Amen. And therefore, you are a witness. What is a witness? It's a person who has seen something or have heard something or experienced something. And we can truly say God's been good to us. Amen? Amen. Let's say it again. God's been good to us. Amen. Say it like you mean it. God's been good to us. Amen. Hallelujah. We didn't deserve it. We didn't work for it. We can't earn it. It was His grace. And because of His grace on us, we proclaim the good news of grace. God's unmerited favor. God doing us a favor. Praise the Lord to people we come in contact with. People say, I don't deserve it. That's why it's called for grace. I didn't do it, didn't work for it. That's what it's called grace. And we are here to proclaim this good news. Number three. The third evangelism of good news is what I call persuasion. Persuade people to accept Christ. As a church, we must develop effective ways to help people accept Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. Sometimes people say no. And we give up too quickly. Because you, when you first heard the gospel, so you maybe just didn't run except right there. You were like, I don't know about this. And aren't you glad people didn't give up on you? Amen. Just because you turned them down the first time? How they do it. Look what the scripture says here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 11. He says, so we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. Oh, so everything is talking about one day dying. For we live by believing, not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident that we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. Okay? 
So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. I got a news flash for everybody. Fresh off the press. Here it is. Unless Jesus comes back, all of us is going to die sometime. Y'all look at me like, oh, it's going to happen, praise the Lord. It, it, it's going to, unless he comes back, all of us, one day we're going to die. It's simple as that. But here's the great thing about it is, when we die, we may be absent from this physical body that we came in this world naked. Now, if you, if you were born in this world with clothes on, they can talk to you. <laughs> I have met a person yet born in this world with some clothes on. <laughs> All right? You were born stripped naked. No clothes at all. And then one day you're going to die. You're going to listen. You're going to lay down this earthly body that you have. That you didn't bring anything to it. But here's the great thing. You're going to have a new, glorified, incorruptible, immortal body. And you'll be present with the Lord. I'm talking about no more pain, no more heartaches, no more medicine, no more tax man. Come on, somebody. No more traffic. Huh? No more dieting, what you can't eat. <laughs> And you'll be free from all of that. Amen. But here's the great thing. You'll be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Yeah. And I go, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Yeah. And where I am, you will be also. You will be in my presence all the time. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. This is what I'm preparing for you right now. All of this we're going through right now is nothing but rehearsal. Yes. It's practice to get ready for a greater life. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. He says, for we must all, verse 10, all stand before Christ to be judged. Not judge whether we're going to heaven or not. Judge what, we, what kind of rewards we're going to get while we live on this earth. That's what we'll be judged for. If we go to heaven, it's a done deal. Jesus took care of that 2,000 years ago. He took all the judgment upon him for our sins. So we will never be judged for our sins whether or not we go to heaven or not. But we will be judged for what we do in our body, what kind of rewards we receive. And the Bible calls them crowns. Now watch this. He says, for we must receive whatever we deserve for good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So that will be a payday at the end of the way. Hallelujah. So because of this good news, watch this. Because we share this to people, that you don't have to die for sins. You don't have to, to die and go to hell and be lost eternally. You can have a new life, better than you ever experienced. This will be the only hell you ever experience on this earth. Hallelujah. It'll get better and better. So because of this, no the verse left. Because we understand our fearful or our reverent responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. You don't want your worst enemy to lost and to go to hell. Now, let me think about it even now. But no, no, come on now. Yeah, you can, well, Pastor, let us just, just, just get singed a little bit, all right? Okay, let us just get a little taste of what it is. You don't want your worst enemy to be lost. Amen. What place was reserved for the devil, Satan, and all of his angels? Whether it be weeping and gnashing of teeth, whether it be out of darkness, totally away from the presence of God. You don't want anybody to experience that. Amen. So because of that, watch this, he says, we persuade others. We're urgent about this thing. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. The reason why we're on Facebook, we're persuading others. 
The reason why we tell you to hit like Facebook and tell you to hit share, because yeah, we are here to persuade you that there is a better life. We've been there and done that, and we tell you, life on this side is a whole lot better. Amen. Yes, we do have challenges, we do the go through these things, whatever, but you know what? We found out that Jesus is the answer. Yeah. Hallelujah. So we do all that we can to persuade. Yeah. Reason why grandma and, 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 and aunts and uncles haven't given up on you because they're that they love you and they want to persuade you. Amen. This is why I don't give up on anybody. Because look at all the rewards she shows you. So as a church, we do everything we can to persuade others. This is what we call persuasion evangelism. Number four. So the question we say is with number three is, how are we helping people to make decisions for Christ? I mean, some people just got to tell me, get out of my face. You know, and still I may not give up on them at the end of that time. Thank you what you Because nobody gave up on me. Amen. When, listen, and y'all, and stop this thing about, well, I got to wait for them to get their lives together. I just going to say that you ain't got your life together. Amen. But I mean, I ain't telling G till they stop smoking, stop drinking, stop lying, stop cussing. What? That's what Jesus came for. If they, listen, don't you think that if they could have changed, they would have did it after 20, 30, 40 years by now? Amen. They cannot do it by themselves. Amen. They need a Savior who can make a difference in their lives. Amen. So number four, progressive evangelism. Help people progress in their Christian life. As a church, we must develop follow-up programs and materials that turn new believers and new church members into new disciples for Christ Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. New believers into new church members watch this, into new disciples, why? Into new changing. We are here to make a difference. They come in as a new believer, new church member, new disciple, watch this, and now changing. So what did Paul say? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he made it very simple. He says, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Because people can't see all the things. They don't see all the grace whatsoever. They don't understand about mercy. They don't understand about sanctification, justification, and reconciliation, and redemption. They know they don't understand it. But one thing they can understand is looking at your life. Now they can understand that. And so listen, you want to live a life so much to say, you know what? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah, I got some faults and I want some things I'm working on so forth and all. But what I do for the Lord, I want you to do those same things. So if you see me reading my Bible, guess what? Imitate me and start reading your Bible. If you start seeing me praying, I want you to imitate me as I start praying. Because many times people don't do what they we say, they do yeah. what they see. And that's how they're gonna progress. And you gotta come to a point that says, you know what, Lord? I don't want to do anything purposely in my life that would hinder somebody yeah. from getting close to you. That's what you have to say. Yeah. And then, if you miss it, listen to me now, because we're not under condemnation. We don't condemn ourselves. When you miss it, just go to God and say, God, forgive me, make me stronger the next time. And so what happened was when people come and say, well, listen, I thought you were a Christian. Well, why, why did you do that? I said, you know what? I missed it. I made a mistake, but I asked God for forgiveness, and God has forgiven me of my sins, and now I go on with my life. Amen. I don't stay down. I don't have a pity party. I don't make a bunch of excuses. I say, I didn't get it right. Forgive me. I'm going to get better next time. Amen. And people will start imitating that. But if they see us with all this and all that, Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. That we never done anything? That we never smoked anything? Oh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> drank anything? When they see that we got all our ducks in the line all the time, they need to hear from us. Says, yeah, you know what? I've got some things I'm not proud of. But God has forgiven me. 
And just as he has forgiven me, he has forgiven you. So I don't live in my past mistakes. I'm just getting better and better and better. Pastor, why you ain't done this? You know what? Forgive me, I'm getting better. That's why he said that. I'm getting better. Forgive me. I'm getting better. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And so when people see that, they see that you're real. Yes. They see that you're genuine. Yeah. They see that you're not a hypocrite. You're not phony. Right. Amen. But you're getting better because he says, imitate me just as imitate Christ. I'm trying to be like Christ, not like somebody else. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so that's what progression evangelism is all about. We are helping people continuing in their faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen to my Facebook. I want to tell you, praise the Lord. You find some people that you can imitate. You find some people, you're going through some things, find some people who've done that and then they've done that, that you can help them. Yes. And they can help you. Amen. And you work together. And that's how you get stronger. You don't sit back and make excuses and say, there ain't nobody done that before. Ain't nobody perfect. No, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to be like Jesus. Amen. And you know how people always compare themselves? Compare themselves to somebody who's worse. You ever notice that somebody? Well, why you do that? Well, I know somebody else didn't do that. Why you look at them? Look at Jesus. <laughs> they can't help make you better than Jesus can. Amen. And the more you keep your eyes on Jesus, the better you become. Amen. Hallelujah! And then the fifth and final one is production evangelism. It says, help people produce new believers. As a church, we must train members so they can become witnesses for Christ. Hallelujah. Because you know what? Sometimes people, they may not remember the sermon, but they remember your testimony. They'll remember that. They'll remember where you come from. And how you got to where you are. Amen. This is produced. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and verse 7. And as we looked at this right here, he says, I planted the seeds, as Paul says, I planted the seeds in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. Yeah. It is not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important that God makes the seed to grow. God is the producer. Say that God is my producer. God is my producer. Say it again. God is my producer. God is my producer. When I was preparing this message, the Lord asked me a question. And it really made me think about my life. This is what he says. He asked me a question. He said, Ronnie, are you a producer? Or are you a consumer? And I said, what do you mean, Lord? He says, a producer gives life. A consumer takes life. Are you a giver? When you preach, are you just preaching just to be a preacher? Or are you after giving something? When you help people, are you just doing something because it's a nice thing to do? But are you giving something? You know, or are you taking? Do you give people the advantage or are you taking advantage of people? And yes, my friends, there are people, including preachers, that take advantage of people. Scaring people. If you don't give a thousand dollars, God's going to curse you. God can not curse you. Don't let some TV preacher get on and tell you, unless you send a hundred dollars, I got to go off the air. Just say, bye. <laughs> I guess you go. Don't let people pressure you. They're taking advantage. But a producer gives the advantage to see the best of you. So I ask myself all the time, am I giving or am I taking? I said, Lord, I'll be with this. You see, when I go into the grocery store and I see the bananas and I see the see the grapes and I you know and, and I see the oranges and I see the apples, the sign does not say fruit. 
It says what? Produce. Why? Because within that fruit, there is a seed. And there are seeds. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yes. And the seeds can produce more fruit. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. And I stop to let you know, here at House of Faith, we we're just seeds. We were just sowing. That's why I don't look at the outside circumstances. I don't look at all those things that people say and, and say, I just look at, Lord, I just want to be a seed. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That when someone consumes me, Lord, that they will be a giver instead of being a consumer. That I want to make a difference. That I want to imitate of Jesus. That's what people want. When people biting you. They see the seed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because guess what? The fruit itself can spoil, but the seed continues to grow. And if I said this, say it again. People can count the amount of seeds in an apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can know, open up an apple and count the seeds. Watch this. But you can never count the amount of apples in a seed. Think about that. Because in that seed, hundreds and thousands. And that's what you do. When you tell people about Jesus, you are sowing seeds. When you pray for people, you are sowing seeds. When you put your hands on people and believe that they did it, you are sowing seeds. When you believe in people, you are sowing seeds. When you share the good news, you are producing Jesus. And I'm so more important of producing Jesus than I'm producing Ryan Silver. I don't want people to see right and something. I don't see the Jesus in me. That will produce more and more and more. And that's why we are sharing the good news. That's the production. And we want to produce. Say that. I say we want to produce. We want to make a mark upon this face of this earth that will never ever be erased. Why? Because God will make our seeds grow. Praise the Lord. And I don't know. When it happened. But I do know you continue to plant seeds. You continue to do good. You continue to pray for people. You continue to believe in people. You continue to confess the word of Jesus. Just continue to sow seeds. Sow seeds. Sow seeds when you want to. Sow seeds when you don't want to. Sow seeds when you're tired. Sow seeds when you don't feel like going. Just continue to sow seeds and we'll be produced. And we'll be looking. As I close, there was a story told. True of the Chinese bamboo tree that grows over in China. And this tree is so unique because when the seed is planted, every day that seed has to be watered. That seed has to be fertilized. And for Five first five years, nothing is shown. Can you imagine every day going out front, fertilizing and watering the seed, and there's no evidence? Can you imagine what your neighbors are saying about you? Hmm, let go that food out there. Water, fertilizer, wasting his time. Even Ray Charles and Stephen Wonder can see nothing happened here. <laughs> but every day you go out, you fertilize this seed, and you water this seed, and you endure the criticism. You endure people making fun of you. Mm. They just go in their own house of faith. Hmm. Ain't nothing happened there. They don't even have their own building. Hmm. Ain't nothing going on there. And you continue to come. You continue to pray. You continue to confess the word. You continue to give. You continue to love. And don't seem like nothing is happening. To the world, it seems like you're just wasting your time. Hmm. 8.30, this little early for me. But you continue to fertilize every day, every Sunday, 
every day. You water that seed. You plant that seed. You fertilize that seed. And for the first five years, nothing appears to be happening. Watch this. After the fifth year, that seed breaks the ground. And that tree that was hidden for five years, it grows to become 50 feet tall. One of the largest trees in China. Question. When did that tree grow? Did it grow once it broke the surface? No. It grew because people continue to fertilize it, continue to water it over and over and over and over again because they realized that they had to do some production. Over and over again. And once it breaks through, hallelujah, everybody can see it. Everybody will come pat you on the back. Everybody will praise you. Everybody will say, oh, I knew you can do it. Hallelujah. But they didn't see it when it was up in the ground. And I want to tell you, praise the Lord. God has house of faith. Glory to God. Not trying to keep something from us, but keeping something for us. Praise the Lord. We're under the ground. We're being nurtured. We're being watered. We're being trumpeted. We're being fertilized. And nobody sees it in me. And they say, you're wasting your time. You might as well quit and give up. But what they don't know, what we know. That one day, when we break through, unstoppable. Hallelujah. And all those prayers, all that sacrifice, all that worshiping, all that praying, all that loving, all that giving will pay off. Because we share the good news. Your best of feet. Hallelujah. That's what the church is all about. Fulfilling the purpose of evangelism. Don't you give up on that person the Lord put in your life because you don't see the results. Don't you stop unless the Lord tells you to stop. You continue on. You continue to persevere because you remember you're called to make a difference. Not a living. Let's go ahead and take our five confessions regarding a strategy for evangelism. Number one, say this, I confess, I confess that, I that I will let the light, the light in, my personal life in my personal life shine for Jesus. Shine for Jesus. Number two, say I confess, I confess that as opportunity arises, that opportunity I, will share I will share the good news, the good news of, Jesus Christ of Jesus Christ to others. To others. Number three, say I confess, I confess that as opportunity arises, that opportunity I will arise. assist people. I will to make, to make decisions and accept Jesus, Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Number four is I confess I that I will assist I will new believers believe into becoming new disciples for Jesus, Jesus Christ. Number five is I confess I that I will assist others in becoming witnesses for Jesus, for Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, that's always called with you. We're called to do it. It's simple, but sometimes it's not easy. Because our flesh gets in the way. Our emotion gets in the way. Our opinions, what people think about us, gets in the way. But you know, none of that died for you. Only Jesus gave his life for you. And he says, just follow me. Follow me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's take our prayer commitment. Ready? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you are fulfilling your purpose for my life through evangelism. This is the good news to the world, that Jesus Christ came, lived, died, and was raised from the dead to rescue the world from sin and death. I thank you that you have given me a fivefold strategy for finding the lost, the unsaved, and the unchurched through presence proclamation, persuasion, progression, and production evangelism. As I realize this, I understand that you have given me a grace for the winning team in 2019. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
Praise the Lord.